um, summarize a little bit about some of the stuff that we've talked about. There are a lot of different ideas that we've kind of worked through in this class. Um, uh, in unit one especially, we talked about how um, electrochemical signals in neurons communicate information. Um, and then this actually relates back to some of the stuff that came up um, in unit four when we were talking about um, sensory systems and the way that action potentials and synaptic communication represent information um, and that neurons um, represent uh, um, Re represent, convert the external world into action potentials, and then um, extract and transmit that information about the world um, in through the, uh, into the brain, and ultimately through the brain to, to result in um, um, uh, mo motor outputs, for example. Um, We've also talked, there have been a few cases in this class where we've sort of seen that neurons are imperfect processors um, in a lot of different ways. Um, one example is that um, neurons in the sensory system seem to encode very precisely incoming information with their timing of their action potentials, um, but the brain is actually seems to be unable to take advantage of a lot of that beautiful information present in the timings of action potentials. Um, and so it's almost like um, uh, we're reading the animal's uh, sensory inputs or we're reading the animal's mind better than its own brain can read its sensory inputs when we record the timing of every single action potential. Um, and, and so um, the br brains work, but, they, uh, but the, not necessarily as ideally as we might hope that they would. Um, in this last example, as well as in unit three, we talked a lot about how experiences alter neural communication um, and, um, and alter the wiring in your cortex, alter the maps that you have, whether it's a visual to auditory correspondence map, a motor, uh, a motor cortex to movement map, um, uh, the, uh, um, the way that the, uh, the, the, the experiences and interactions that we have with the world change the wiring and, and communication with our brain. Um, this also is actually a big thing in Unit 2 where we talked about declarative memory and the cellular basis with long-term potentiation for how experience alters the way neurons communicate with one another. Um, and then the last thing, which is sort of a little bit more of an abstract idea um, with this, is that um, in, in thinking about science and pursuing science, um, ideas and clever, clever questions are really the foundation of a great scientific inquiry. Um, but what ultimately decides things um, is the data that's out there. Um, and thinking back to Unit 2 especially, um, we saw um, a lot of different ideas and perspectives. Um, but the, the, the new data about silent synapses created a new theoretical framework. And all of a sudden, that new theoretical framework explain not only some of the data about silent synapses, but some of the earlier data that had been used on the opposite side of the, of the um, uh, um, debate. And so, um, and so that made it a much more attractive theoretical framework for explaining a large amount of experimental observations. Um, and I'm not going to read through all of these because they're mostly um, throughout the, the syllabus, um, but uh, just some ideas about kind of uh, you know, why we work through some of these different um, uh, 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 situations with critical analysis and scientific debate and so on is, um, is I hope that even if you forget a lot of the specific facts about the brain that we talked about in this class, that you'll remember sort of these ideas about data analysis and, and, um, and how to um, work with data and understand the limitations and, um, and, and the interactions between data and interpretation, which played into the reports as well as other things. So anyway, um, thank you for a nice semester, and I will see you all on the third Sunday and then on the final exam on Tuesday.